Well, thank you all very much for coming to Quit Money Missoula, Quit Money Day Missoula. And uh, tonight we have our very special guest, local author Mark Sundin with us. Um, he's the author of The Man Who Quit Money, and we have several special guests who he'll be introducing later on this evening. Um, Mark is a quite broadly published author. His nonfiction has appeared in the New York Times, Magazine, Outside, National Geographic, Adventure, The Believer, and other places. His previous books include Car Camping, The Making of Toro, and North by Northwestern. He has been on the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and now LA Times bestseller list. He has taught fiction and nonfiction at the MFA Creative Writing Programs at the University of New Mexico and Western Connecticut State University and the Taos Summer Writers Conference. We are very, very lucky to call him our own local author as he shares his time between Missoula and Utah. And so now I'd love you to give a warm welcome to Mark Sundin. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. Thanks, Molly. And not just for that intro, but thanks, Molly, for putting this whole event together. This is yeah. pretty amazing to, to, be in a, to live in a city that has a a library and a, and a staff of librarians who can make something like this happen. This is great. Thank you so much. It feels great to be supported. Um, and thank you all for, for coming. This is just amazing. This is a, you know, when I first started publishing books, I had a series of events with zero people in the audience. It was, it was just me and the um, person who worked at Barnes & Noble. And she was like, well, I can give you a sandwich and a cup of coffee. And then I left. Um, I also want to say a, a quick thank you to um, the publisher of this book, Riverhead Penguin. Um, they donated 150 copies of the book to the library, and the library has now passed them all over to you, I believe. And this is something you would never expect to happen in the New York publishing industry. And the way it happened was that when uh, Daniel Swilov agreed to be interviewed for this book, uh, he said he didn't want to be paid, because he doesn't use money. And, um, but he said he'd do it anyway, because he liked the idea. And then he wrote an email that said, you know, I don't want you to make any promises or vows, but is there a way that you could give this book away for free? And um, the publisher actually has found ways to do that, and this is, I think, the culmination of that. We've done about six of these events, but this is the biggest event, and, and the, um, the most books. And, I like it that way because I live here and I really want to, uh, you know, give something back to this uh, city that supports me. So thanks for coming. <laughs> so basically, in a nutshell, what we're going to talk about tonight is um, the fact that we have an economic system that's that's a problem in our country and probably the rest of the countries in the world too. And I want to talk about alternatives to that system. And I want to talk about uh, philosophical, ethical, and spiritual reasons for choosing alternatives. I mean, why not just live by the status quo? And the panelists tonight are going to help us answer that question. Um, but, you know, you look around at the hot-button political movements of our times, you have the, all across the spectrum, on the right you have the, uh, the Tea Party, on the left you have Occupy, maybe in the middle you have climate change. And people are saying, the system is, is broken, and we don't have the power to fix it. In fact, we feel powerless to fix it. I mean, like, how can I complain about Wall Street if I have a bank account? And how can I complain about the Fed when I use money? And how can I complain about global warming when I drive a car? And what I've learned through writing this book and through talking with all the people who are going to be on stage tonight is that there are alternatives, and there, are, there is some hope and optimism. Anyway, I'm going to read for about, oh, maybe 30 minutes. And I'm going to read the first page of the book. In case you haven't read it yet, this will kind of give you an idea of what it's all about. And then I'm going to skip far ahead and start talking about the economy and try to explain in nine pages why I think it's a problem worth talking about. Okay, so here it goes. And then I'll bring everyone out. In the first year of the 21st century, a man standing by a highway in the middle of America pulled from his pocket his life savings, 
laid it inside a phone booth, and walked away. He was 39 years old, came from a good family, and had been to college. He was not mentally ill, nor an addict. His decision appears to have been an act of free will by a competent adult. In the 12 years since, as the Dow Jones skyrocketed to its all-time high, Daniel Suelo has not earned, received, or spent a single dollar. In an era when anyone who could sign his name qualified for a mortgage, Suelo did not apply for loans or write IOUs. He didn't even barter. As the public debt soared to eight, 10, finally $13 trillion, he did not pay taxes or accept food stamps, welfare, or any other form of government handout. Instead, he set up a house in caves in the Utah Canyonlands, where he forages mulberries and wild onions, scavenges roadkill, raccoons, and squirrels, pulls expired groceries from dumpsters, and is often fed by friends and strangers. He says, my philosophy is to use only what is freely given or discarded and what is already present and running. While the rest of us grapple with tax deductions, variable rate mortgages, retirement plans, and money market accounts, Suelo no longer holds so much as an identification card. Yet the man who sleeps under bridges and prospects and trash cans is not a typical hobo. He does not panhandle, and he often works, declining payment for his efforts. While he is driven by spiritual beliefs and longings, he is not a monk, nor is he associated with any church. And although he lives in a cave, he is not a hermit. He is relentlessly social and remains close with friends and family, and engages in discussions with strangers via the website he maintains from the public library. He has crisscrossed the West by bicycle, hopped freight trains, hitched through nearly every state in the Union, hauled nets on a Bering Sea trawler, harvested mussels and kelp from Pacific beaches, spearfished salmon in Alaska streams, and braved three months of storms atop an ancient hemlock tree. I know it is possible to live with zero money, Suelo declares, abundantly. <clears throat> so uh, in the past, I used to write really funny books. <laughs> and I'd have these readings, and people would laugh. <laughs> And it made me feel good, because I knew they were listening. <laughs> and now I've written this book about the economy, and about suicide, and death, and the meaning of life, and it's pretty serious. Sometimes it's hard to stand up here and read, because it seems like, I mean, I like to think that everyone's just wrapped, and, and, and can't you know, hang in on every word. But maybe they're just asleep. <laughs> anyway, as I read, I just want to encourage you to um, if you see or if you hear anything that's even remotely could be construed as funny, just go ahead and laugh. <laughs> okay. Uh, at first glance, well, I'm going to start with the. Um, Excuse me. What page are you on? So we can read along. Good question. This 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 page doesn't have a number. <laughs> it's a 185. Thank you. Okay, and it starts with a a. a a line from Ecclesiastes. Then I saw that all toil and all skill and work came from a man's envy of his neighbor. This is also vanity and striving after wind. At first glance, the late 1990s would seem the oddest of historical moments to become disillusioned with money for the mere fact that there was so much of it floating around. After the fall of the Soviet Union, capitalism reigned triumphant, and America embraced it more firmly than ever. While the culture wars raged over social issues like homosexuality and abortion, in the realm of economics there emerged a peculiar consensus. With Bill Clinton as their captain, Democrats rallied to causes that CAEOs had championed for decades. Clinton and a Republican Congress united to deregulate industry, reduce the welfare state, and open foreign markets by reducing tariffs. The result of the North American Free Trade Agreement of 1993, the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which deregulated broadcasting, and the Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999, which deregulated banking, in concert with the boom in computers and finance, was a historic spike in gross domestic product, stock prices, and corporate profits. Suelo parted with his final dollars in 2000, the same year that the dot-com bubble peaked, 
the NASDAQ reached its all-time high, and Forbes magazine reported, there's more money at the top than ever before, combined 1.2 trillion for the 400 richest Americans, up from 1 trillion last year. If, by the way, instead of foolishly dropping his last $30 into a payphone, Suelo had bought a plot of dirt and then cannily sold his nano acre before the crash, his net worth today might be almost $100. <laughs> At number one was Bill Gates, whose fortune had topped 101 billion, making him the world's first centibillionaire. Meanwhile, his business partner, Paul Allen, was about to drop a cool 100 million for a 301 foot, five story mega yacht that housed a movie theater and two helicopter pads. Another windfall economic event of that year, in addition to the whoever uh, found Suelo's cash in the phone booth, was the largest corporate merger in history between Time Warner and America Online to the tune of $152 billion. A similar boom had occurred in the Reagan years, but back then, the titans of finance, Ivan Boesky, Michael Milken, and Charles Keating, and their ilk, had exuded a whiff of villainy, epitomized by the credo of Hollywood bad guy Gordon Gekko, that greed is good. In the 80s, maybe, money had been an evil thing, writes the critic Thomas Frank, a tool of demonic coke-snorting vanity of hostile takeovers and SNL ripoffs, And throughout that decade, a parade of sourpusses, Jimmy Carter, Walter Mondale, Mike Dukakis, and their ilk, had insisted that greed was not good and that the moral thing to do was pay higher taxes and wear a sweater indoors when the weather was cold. <laughs> <clears throat> Judging by the performance of these candidates at the polls, only a minority of Americans agreed with them. But in the 90s, with the advent of the New Democrats, the opposition to greed seemed to have evaporated altogether. Bill Clinton allowed his party map Bill Clinton allowed his party members to straddle a wide chasm. They could still call themselves progressive when it came to fraternizing with gays and listening to Lauren Hill's latest disc, but also they could be quote fiscally conservative and support NAFTA, which is legislation that a decade earlier would have been decried as rank colonialism. Business kings like Gates and Richard Branson and Larry Ellison were lionized. Uh, Thomas Frank writes, Our billionaires were no longer slave-driving martinets or pump-and-dump Wall Street manipulators. They were people's plutocrats, doing it without tie and suit, chatting easily with the rank and file, pushing the stock prices up benevolently this time, making sure we all got to share in the profit-taking. At the heart of the new consensus was a belief that money itself carried wisdom. We all want money, went the reasoning, therefore money is good. And if only government would, with its do-good moralizing would just butt out, we would all prosper. Uh, con Frank concludes, from deadheads to Nobel laureate economists, from paleoconservatives to new democrats, American leaders in the 90s came to believe that markets were a popular system, a far more democratic form of organization than democratically elected governments. Any pangs of conscience that liberals might feel about their unprecedented lucre were allayed by a belief that gracious America was spreading the wealth far and wide. International agencies like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund were pumping cash into the third world to develop agriculture and industry and infrastructure so that all boats might rise with the tide. In 1995, 153 nations formed the World Trade Organization with the goal of greasing the gears of trade so that even the poorest countries could benefit. But as the stock market soared and the coffers filled, the consensus began to crack. Critics on both the left and right, from Ralph Nader to Ron Paul, noticed that for all the historic numbers, the bull market wasn't benefiting the average American. Income equality, which had reached historic lows around 1970, had crept back to the levels of the Gilded Age. 80% of the increase in Americans' income between 80 and 2005 landed in the accounts of the top 1%. Business League noted that in 1990, CEOs earned 85 times more than workers. In 1999, they earned 475 times more. Globalization thumped the American farm and factory, wiping out middle-class jobs. <clears throat> it also brought cell phones to the <laughs> economic forefront. <laughs> and while it's true that in the 1990s, some Americans were taking home more dollars than ever, 
Their raises did not necessarily indicate a larger piece of the pie. Many of the families that maintained the buying power of the previous generation did so not with better jobs, but thanks to the combination of cheap foreign goods and two working parents. The Economic Policy Institute reported that in 1999, Americans worked six weeks more per year than the decade before. Six weeks per person. Full-time jobs with benefits and retirement plans were replaced with temp and part-time that required workers to dig into their paychecks for health insurance and retirement contributions or forsake them altogether. As a result, the average personal savings rate slipped into freefall. And in 1999, it dipped into the red. In other words, Americans were now borrowing money to maintain the standard of living that their parents had paid for outright. Those icons of the 90s, shimmering SUVs and sprawling McMansions, those were on loan from the bank. Against the tide of historic corporate profits and stock prices, real wages had receded. A majority of people were not lenders, but borrowers, whose net worth was zero or negative. Probably a lot of people in this room can relate to that feeling. I've been there. The decade's prosperity was a facade. The first revolt came from the left in the fall of 1999. A coalition of labor unions, environmentalists, and social justice advocates took aim at the four-year-old World Trade Organization, which was scheduled to convene in Seattle in November. Deaf to the hoorays about the new economy spilling from politicians like Clinton and pundits like Tom Friedman, environmentalists mistrusted the WTO. It was, after all, an unelected international body with no legal jurisdiction that had nonetheless thwarted laws passed by the elected officials of sovereign nations. For instance, the U.S. Endangered Species Act prohibited American importers from buying shrimp that had been harvested with nets that could accidentally kill sea turtles. Asian nations, Asian nations challenged the law before the WTO, which sided with the shrimpers. America was forced to back down. Organized labor had its own reason for opposing the meeting. One tenet of the WTO's mission to, quote, liberalize international trade was to enable corporations to set up shop in other countries. After a century of struggle to establish workplace conditions that we take for granted, a 40-hour work week, overtime, compensation for job injuries, elimination of child labor, unions saw their jobs vanish as bosses simply shuttered American factories and relocated to third world countries that had no such laws. And so it was that on November 30th, an odd mix of hard hats and people dressed as sea turtles, with a healthy smattering of jugglers and puppeteers, blocked the streets around the Seattle Convention Center, not merely protesting the meeting of the WTO ministers, but actually preventing it. Anyone in this room take part in that? A couple people. Oh, Hillary's out there. She took part. All right. Um, it was not only the most powerful blow to date against the globalization free-for-all, but the most successful economics-driven display of civil disobedience in American history. Surprising as it is that the opposition to international monetary policy could bring together longshoremen and tree-huggers, what's truly peculiar is that similar antipathies were also aligning those left-leaning groups with the far right. In 1994, a member of the John Birch Society, C. Edward Griffin, self-published The Creature from Jekyll Island, a 600-page screed against the Federal Reserve. His thesis is that America's central bank, the Fed, is merely a cartel that with the blessing of Congress has established a legal monopoly that will inevitably bankrupt the United States and all her citizens. Now in its 25th printing and translated into Japanese, Vietnamese, and German, the book has become a Magna Carta for gold bugs and tea partiers, livid about government bailouts and the spiraling national debt. To understand the breadth of the book's appeal, consider that it got blurbs from both Ron Paul and Willie Nelson. <laughs> when in 2010 I requested a copy from my local public library, which is this one, I was informed that 25 patrons were ahead of me on the waiting list. <laughs> Some may cringe at Griffin's discovery of socialist conspiracy in every historical event from the Bull Moose presidential run of Theodore Roosevelt to the sinking of the Lusitania, the crash of 29, the collapse of Soviet Union, and the founding of Earth Day. 
but his plain critique of monetary policy is illuminating and alarming. He writes, with a flourish oddly reminiscent of Karl Marx himself, the total of this human effort is ultimately for the benefit of those who create fiat money. It is a form of modern serfdom in which the great mass of society works as indentured servants to a ruling class of financial nobility. That's someone in the John Birch Society saying that. So it's so getting weird when the right is starting to sound like Karl Marx. <laughs> Unlike most modern monetary critics, Griffin begins by addressing the question, what is money? Since its earliest inception, he tells us, money has been a medium of exchange. The barter system, of course, predates money. A poultry farmer might trade a dozen chickens to a grain farmer for a bushel of wheat. As villages became larger and trade more complex, the direct trading became impractical. Try stuffing a dozen chickens in your wallet. So materials such as beads and seashells were used as tokens of barter, money. In the American colonies, tobacco leaves were used as currency. They were durable, lightweight, and easy to transport. Best yet, to avoid losses in an inflationary market, one could merely stop spending and start smoking. <laughs> The most permanent of these commodity monies was precious metals. Gold and silver and copper had the advantage of being rare to ensure that the market would not be flooded. They were also non-perishable and easy to transport, weigh, and divide. The use of metal money lasted for centuries with relative success and ended only recently. The system's demise, however, began almost at its inception. Because once a man amassed more gold than he could safely store at home, he sought a secure vault. For a small fee, he stored his wealth in the warehouse of the goldsmith. When he made his deposit, the proprietor, proprietor issued a receipt that stated, pay to the bearer on demand. And thus, paper money was born. People soon learned that the paper receipts were equal to their stated worth in gold, and could, indeed could be redeemed at the vault for gold itself. So it became safe to exchange the currency for goods and services while the gold sat safely in the warehouse. Okay, good, right? But here's where the problem started. The goldsmiths realized that they were sitting on a fortune in unused gold. As long as the paper receipts were trusted as money, people rarely redeemed them for gold. So by lending out his customers gold and charging interest, the clever goldsmith could make additional profit, hence the ascent of the modern bank. Now let's say the blacksmith deposits 100 gold dollars and receives 100 paper dollars as his receipt. The banker turns around and lends those 100 gold coins to the farmer, who, not wanting to lug around a sack of heavy metal, immediately redeposits the coins in exchange for 100 paper dollars. Suddenly there's twice as many paper dollars as there are gold coins. If the farmer and the blacksmith arrive at the bank at the same moment demanding coins, they will find only 100 gold dollars for their 200 vouchers. By artificially doubling the supply of paper money, the banker has halved its value. The blacksmith and the farmer must now redeem their paper dollars for 50 cents each. Multiply this scenario by a thousand or a million and we have a run on the banks. Oh, and by the way, even though the farmer has lost $50 because of the banker's scheme, he must still pay the banker interest on the full 100 that he borrowed. So the banker tends to win either way. This system, in which paper money is worth only a fraction of its stated value in gold and silver, was employed in the United States into the 20th century. Then Congress created the Federal Reserve, authorized it to print, to print millions of dollars of currency that was not directly bound to gold or silver or any other real commodity. It's a mind-boggling concept, but what it boils down to, says Griffin, is a grand counterfeiting racket. When the economy is stagnant, the Fed simply prints currency and lends it, with interest, to the United States Treasury, which distributes the loot to county and state road departments, to military contractors, and of course, as interest payments to the banks and investors that lent the money the last time around. Hence, the national debt. American dollars are not redeemable for actual wealth, like, say, the gold bars at the Fort Knox Bullion Depository. They are merely IOUs from the Treasury to the Fed. If Congress needs a trillion dollars, the Fed waves its magic wand and the money appears. There's no need to consult the voters or raise their taxes. 
Suddenly, the money exists, and another trillion dollars is marked in a ledger added to the national debt. What we think is money is but a grand illusion, concludes Griffin. The reality is debt. In fact, if everyone paid back all that was borrowed, there would be no money left in existence. Wow. <laughs> William Grider, who is a political reporter for The Nation and Rolling Stone and The Washington Post, he critiques the Fed from the opposite side of the spectrum in his book, The Secrets of the Temple, and he reaches a similar conclusion. He says, above all, money was a function of faith. It required an implicit and universal social consent that was indeed mysterious. To create money and use it, each one must believe and everyone must believe. Only then did the worthless pieces of paper take on value. As our money shifts from metals to currency to credit cards and online transactions, the illusion becomes even more pronounced. Greider writes, when money is no longer represented even by paper, it becomes a pure abstraction, numbers filed somewhere in the memory of a distant computer. In the computer, it cannot be seen by anyone, neither its owner nor the bank clerk who does the accounting. Faith notwithstanding, why do we continue to accept these counterfeit dollars, even as their value is decimated by inflation? Because it's the law. The government has mandated that this funny money be legal tender for all debts, public and private. It is a crime to not accept it. Imagine how you'd be laughed out of the HR office if you demanded your salary not by cash, check, or direct deposit, but in gold bullion. <laughs> Our type of money, intrinsically value valueless, but mandated by law as legal tender, is called fiat money, and according to Griffin, is the first fissure in the dike of civilization. He writes, the chain of events begins when fiat money created by a central bank, sorry, the chain of events begins with fiat money created by a central bank, which leads to government debt, which causes inflation, which destroys the economy, which impoverishes the people, which provides an excuse for increasing government power, which is an ongoing process culminating in totalitarianism. Or, as William Greider puts it, when a society lost faith in money, it was implicitly losing faith in itself. Okay, let me drink a bit of water here. I'm going to read about one sentence, or one page about Daniel, and I'm going to invite everyone up here. <clears throat> now I'm going to page uh, 18. Uh, Suedo's quest for free parking might be easy if he availed himself of government programs or private homeless shelters. But Suelo refuses these charities as byproducts of the money system he rejects. Government programs are funded by taxes paid not freely but out of legal obligation. Most shelters are staffed by paid workers who give only with the expectation of a check. Suelo does, however, accept hospitality that is freely given. He has knocked on the door of a Catholic worker's house, a Unitarian church, and a Zen center, and has been offered a place to sleep. He has spent time in a number of communes, including one in Georgia, where members weave hammocks to provide income, and another in Oregon, where residents grow their own vegetables. In Portland, he stays at urban squats populated by anarchists or in communal homes that welcome transients. But wait a minute, isn't Suelo just kidding himself? Is there really any difference between accepting a room in a church and a room in a homeless shelter? And isn't hitchhiking in a gas-powered automobile or blogging from a library computer evidence that he is just as dependent on money as the rest of us? If not on the green paper itself, then certainly the commerce without which there would be no cars or gasoline or libraries or computers. Suelo considers these criticisms. He concedes that by using the public library, he is accepting other people's tax money. And for a while he considered stopping the practice and accessing the internet only at friends' houses. But ultimately he felt he was splitting hairs a bit too finely. He certainly wasn't going to stop walking on public roads merely because they were paid for with taxes. Our economic lives are so intertwined that he could never achieve absolute purity. His intention to give freely what he has without expectation of return and to accept without obligation that which is freely given by others. 
That said, he constantly rethinks and interprets the rules of living without money. After his first couple of months of this experiment, hitchhiking with a friend along the East Coast in 2000, he complained in an email to friends, we've been trying to live without money, but people slipping massive amounts of it into our pink little hands has raised questions of what we should do. I made a rule, I would get rid of it before sunset either give it away or spend it, usually on some little treat that I didn't need, like a chocolate bar. But then that sunset rule turned into sunrise. Finally he decided not to spend the money at all, but rather to give it away. So I am going to stop there, and um, I think what I'm going to do now is just invite Daniel up and talk to him for a while, and then we'll get the rest of the panel up here. So with no further ado, here's uh, Daniel Swilo. Um, all right, so I'm basically going to interview you, is how this is going to work. We've already done about 12 of these before, so I already know what he's going to say, so it's kind of <laughs> staged. <laughs> um, one of the things you talk about a lot is the gift economy, and how this is something that works in nature. Um, can you tell us what that means, what the gift economy is, and how uh, nature has its own type of economy? <laughs> Yeah, I, st I started thinking about this stuff when I was up in Alaska a couple of years before I gave up money. I was, I lived off the land for a little while with a, a Basque dude from Spain. And um, for a while I camped near a raspberry bush and I noticed that, um, of course, raspberries that are ripe and ready to eat they're, they're red and they pull off easily. And it's almost like the raspberry bush is saying, eat me. And I take it and e eat it. And I thought about this concept. It's, it's, it's the process of all of nature that the raspberry bush expected nothing in return. And there's no accountant sitting there by the bush saying, wow, how is this raspberry going to get what it needs back? You know, there's no, nobody with a ledger. And also, me, I felt no obligation to that bush. I ate the raspberry and I went on. And then I would poop out somewhere else later on, um, way away from the, my camp. <laughs> and, and my poop became food for organisms in the ground. And not only that, there were seeds in it which had the potential for another raspberry bush. And, um, and then I thought, well, th I've never seen any two animals haggling over anything. It's like how many, like the, this whole idea of consciousness of credit and debt, it's, it was started dawning on me that Creatures in wild nature don't have consciousness of credit and debt, and neither did I when I was camping out. I had no sense of debt to that bush. And yet, it all works out. How does it work out? How does the economy and ecology of nature function in such balance? And it's precisely because there isn't this consciousness of credit and debt. No worry about who's going to get what. Meanwhile, in our human civilization, commercial civilization, I, I always like to stipulate commercial rather than just civilization because I don't really, th I, I do feel like there's good civilization and bad civilization. But in commercial civilization, um, it's based completely on consciousness of credit and debt. We're always worried, and even with our PhD economists, what nation on earth can balance its budget, much less its environment. And yet the economy of nature is in this beautiful balance. And 
And I started thinking that this, this is gift economy. It's a pay it forward economy. It's like I was paying forward what the raspberry gave to me and somehow it all worked out and the raspberry bush eventually gets what it needs in return. And you could s apply the same principles to a lion hunting wildebeest or whatever. It, it's all in a perfect balance and nobody's worried about it and that's why it works. And I, and I thought how these same principles even apply to everything we do. It's like if you're into Tai Chi or tightrope walking or dancing or playing the piano or whatever, as soon as you are conscious of trying to keep the balance, you, you stumble. And the idea is just relax and nature will take care of the balance. Like for every n positive, there's an equal and opposite negative. And, and this is the principles of gift economy or pay it forward. And I thought, if we function this way, I truly believe we would return to this balance of nature. And it even goes back to our myths. Um, I feel like all over the world we have myths that explain our fall from grace or what separate us from the grace of nature. And grace means gratis, freely giving, freely receiving. And like the myth of stealing fire from heaven, it's like it's this consciousness of credit and debt. And in our own culture, um, our own religious Judeo-Christian tradition, it's taking the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, which is consciousness of credit and debt. All of a sudden, we're worried about. We, we can't freely give expecting nothing in return. And I notice this principle is in the world's religions which it's the one thing that they all have in common, yet it's the, the thing least practiced by all of us. It's giving, expecting nothing in return, and giving up the idea of possession. Giving up possessions and money represents doing, expecting reward. Instead of just out of the instinct of our heart, doing, giving to somebody because they're in need, not out of ulterior motivation. And we all know this inside. If we're true to ourselves, we do something for someone because we love them, or because they're, they're in need. And we, we take without sense of debt. And we do this in our families all the time. All of us do this on a conscious or unconscious level. So I feel like the moneyless system already is here. It's just a matter of cultivating it. But in our society, in our economy, the way it's set up, most of our relations are false out of ulterior motivation. You see, especially if you turn on the TV, you see fake smiles, fake hype. And you might go to the store and you'll see somebody smiling at you, a clerk smiling at you. And and I remember thinking this one time, it's like, wow, are you really smiling at me because you mean it or because you're going to get fired if you don't? And basically, it's, it's, it's an idea of prostitution. It's like, would you rather love somebody because they, would you rather somebody love you out of their heart, out of sincerity, or because they're getting paid? That's it's a very simple concept and that's the principles of gift economy and it's really not very complicated but we've we've made it so complicated with our economists and trying to figure out the balance of nature it's just to me it's just being ourselves so <coughs> my next question you don't use money and you get stuff out of dumpsters and live in caves and you hitchhike. How is that? You know, it sounds like you're still dependent on the money system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the, yeah, this question comes up all the time. Like, um, I get it in the blog a lot, in people's comments. And um, again, I, it, it all comes down to a, a simple principle. It's just 
money is a belief in the head. That's all it is. It's not an actual substance. It's uh, even the word credit means belief, creder, and credibility, and creed. The money system is a creed. It's, it's the world's largest, most commonly believed, most, com most agreed upon religion. And it wouldn't function if two or more people didn't believe in it. And um, to see things as they are, not as an idea, that is to live in truth. So if, if you look at a dollar bill, like we all think of it as money, but if you see it for what it is, it reminded me of a, of a uh, Gilligan's Island episode when I was younger that um, Mr. Howell gave a roll of money to some native on an island, and he, he took the rubber band off, threw the money away, and started playing with the rubber bands. <laughs> <laughs> And that stuck with me. That, that funny episode made a deep impression on me. And I thought, wow, what if we see things as they are, as a child sees them or an animal, instead of this belief in our head? Money, what we call money, represents everything but itself. It represents past and it represents future instead of the present. If we see everything in the present moment, a dollar bill is no longer a dollar bill. It's, it's a pretty picture with art on it. And one time I experimented with that. I found a $20 bill and I made a collage out of it. And um, people are appalled, but it's because we get appalled at that idea because we sacrifice reality for an idea. And I, I would call that idolatry. We're constantly sacrificing real goods and services for this fiction we call money. That's what's happening to the rainforest, blah, blah, blah. But I'm kind of getting off the track <laughs> of the idea. If we erase money and look at just goods and services, then we see that, of course, I'm dependent on the goods and services of other people just as people are dependent on my goods and services that I provide. But mine are devalued and people often call me a mooch that I'm contributing nothing to society because there's no numbers placed on my goods and services. But there's numbers, this fiction placed on other folks' goods and services. So theirs is valued and we even have that in our our vocabulary, so-and-so is worth so much. I'm worth nothing then. <laughs> and we devalue nature because it doesn't have numbers on it. Nobody ever asks, well, um, what does nature contribute? It's like nature contributes everything freely. It's like n we don't stop to think, like, what are we giving back to nature? It's like we, we take so many resources, take them freely. Every, you think about it, everything we get, the ener most of the energy, virtually all of it, that's even running our bodies, running this room, running the lights, is freely given by the sun. You can't even pay it back if you want. And the supplies that have created this room were taking, taken freely from nature. Nobody's saying, wow, we, now we need to give something back to nature. But we who take things from nature think, wow, now I can make a profit off of this. And now I, now I demand something back as if it were mine in the first place when it was freely given to me. And this is why our economy is not working because we don't have a true conception of, of pay it forward and um, or justice so um, so that's what I would say like look look at a pigeon roosting in a skyscraper is the pigeon dependent on money or look at an albatross 
hitching a ride on a boat is it dependent on money or a grizzly bear rummaging through your trash can is he dependent on money or a termite in the wall or you know you could go on and on ant on a sidewalk if we just and I, I feel like the secret of life is just seeing everything for what it is and using it freely freely taking and freely giving the way nature works <coughs> one of the things that Daniel has said in some of these events I always tried to lead him towards his one-liners but he didn't get it <laughs> <there> this time <laughs> he said whenever he said when I take just what I need people call me a mooch and when people take more than they need it's called contributing to the economy <laughs> um, I, have w I got one more question I know this can be is could be a long answer because it's a huge question I'll try to keep it shorter this time <laughs> um, but can you just tell us a little bit about the um, you know you've talked about the world religions what are the religious and spiritual beliefs that that brought you to this uh, to the point where you stopped using money and how is that wound in with the economic stuff well I was brought up in a fundamentalist Christian household and I was very religious as a child I took it very seriously and my family is very religious and uh, but I remember thinking like we would read the Gospels you know the teachings of Jesus and I remember discussing this with my brother I was maybe nine or ten like wow we we don't really keep the teachings of Jesus. Does anybody, you know, and, and why do we call ourselves Christian and yet we, d we keep everything except the teachings of Jesus? Is he just someone to worship or do you actually practice what he says? And, uh, and this stuff, this st stuck in my mind a lot. It kept coming back. And then as I got older and I, I uh, went to college I, st I started learning about other cultures and other religions and I kind of I lapped everything up I could I I think the first scripture I read besides the Bible was the Tao Te Ching and I was like wow this it was blowing me away it's like the same principles were there and then the Dhammapada of the Buddha and, and the Bhagavad Gita it's these same principles of you freely give expecting nothing in return like like the principle of the Tao is uh, that's what it is without expectation or reward and giving up possessions and um, I always wanted to find the common threads among all their world's religions I felt like if you get all the witnesses together and they say the same thing on a certain point, that point is true. And this is what I found. And, it, it, and it's the same principle in nature that I was talking about. It's, it's our natural selves. I feel like the core of our cultures, and it's kind of ironic that our great civilizations, which are becoming more and more capitalistic, consider that their highest, you know, the, the epitome of the sage, the, they, they revolve around a sage who gave up possessions and money, whether you're talking about Jesus or Buddha or Lao Tzu or Muhammad who said poverty is my pride. Um, and these are things that I feel like we need to consider like maybe they're meant to be practiced and not just put up on a shelf as an icon to be worshipped, but actually maybe religion is a Trojan horse that could, like we're following its shell, but maybe deep down it has the answers just as nature does. All right, thanks. <coughs> So we will have a uh, question and answers afterwards. I know that everyone, including myself, would probably like to hear more from Daniel, but we have so many other 
great speakers here. I'm going to start, well, I guess I'll bring them out all at once, but let me just first say that there's this quote from Gandhi, and he said something like, be the change you want to see in the world. In other words, don't wait for it to happen or don't just theorize about it. And I've had the, uh, the pleasure to interview these four panelists over the past couple days just to talk about you know, what are we going to say when we get in front of this big crowd. And I've realized that all of them and Daniel are doing this exact thing that, that Gandhi talked about. Be the change that you want to see in the world. Um, a word that gets thrown around a lot these days is visionary. You know, like so-and-so invented a, a new app for the iPhone, and so he's a visionary. <laughs> but <clears throat> everyone on this um, stage, well, I guess they're not here yet. <laughs> <laughs> everyone who's about to be on this stage is someone who, in my mind, had a vision of what they thought the world should be like. And then they said, you know what, I'm going to go make the world like that. I'm going to pretend it's already like that, and I'm going to start living my life as if this is how it is, and I'm going to make, make this reality. And that's one of the real pleasures of living in a town like Missoula, is it seems like we've got a lot of these people, and as a result, it's a great place to live. Um, so I guess I'll bring up uh, everyone all at once. Um, you guys want to come up, and then I'll introduce you. Where are you? Yeah, come on up. It's fine. Your, your, your name is already written on your plaque, and then, uh, and then you can make sure you're in the right one. Where's our last person? Oh, there he is. All right. Okay, so uh, the people we have here, this is uh, uh, Josh Slavik of the Peace Farm and of the UM Environmental Studies Program and of Garden City Harvest. Yes? Good enough. Uh, Bob Giordano of Free Cycles and Missoula Institute for Sustainable Transportation. Uh, Kate Keller of the Missoula Food Co-op, also a participant in Occupy Missoula. And Christian Kreider, who is the pastor of All Souls Missoula and the founder of Imagine Missoula. And if you don't know what these groups with these big names are, you will know shortly. Um, so I want to first start by talking to Kate Keller. Um, as I said, Kate uh, is the founder, one of the founders, and the, and the manager of the, of the Missoula Food Co-op, where if you don't know, um, they've created a bit of an alternative economy to the type I was describing with, with Wall Street and the WTO. Um, in the Food Co-op, the model is you're a member, you're a part owner of the store, and you work there several hours per month. And the store doesn't make a profit, it just keeps lowering the prices on the food so that you're able to give hours and get food and less money is used. Um, Kate told me that she thinks that the uh, members make about, say, roughly $4 per hour worked. And I said, well, what are some other benefits? So that's what I'm going to ask you, Kate. What are the benefits that maybe can't be quantified? In addition to the savings on food, why do people join the co-op and what are the benefits? Um, I would, so uh, the, when I originally was hired to do the job about seven years ago, I started, um, the people who were, who were incubating the project said, this is what we think. We want to make affordable, we want to make food affordable, local, whole, natural foods affordable to people. We don't want to just start another natural food store. We want to broaden the range of people that we can serve and bring local foods to. And I thought, oh, this is, this is, and this is the model we're going to use. Everyone's going to work. And I said, this is a great social experiment. It's going to be fantastic. So what, um, basically over the, over the course of uh, the last seven years, we've um, developed a group of about 350 people who have contributed and learned. Um, learned. A, I feel like we've all learned a lot more about ownership and the the intangible values of sharing um, a vision and the ideas that 
Daniel brought forward of paying forward your time towards the benefit of the rest of the people that you are co-owning the store with. Um, because we're all sort of working towards a vision together. And so um, the community, um, the culture of reciprocity um, beyond just the bringing down the cost of food is of sharing resources, um, sharing services like acupuncture traded for, you know, lawn maintenance traded for whatever, um, because we have developed a culture of, or we are, and still working on developing a culture of co-ownership and the kind of, we're in this together, what benefits everyone benefits the individual and vice versa. So, so yes, yeah, so the, the, the cool thing, and I've, I've always heard the word co-op, I never really knew what it meant, and also I'm going to say it again, is that the people own the store themselves. It's, I mean, it's a completely different economic model as like the store buys this stuff from the wholesaler and sells it to the customers. I mean, here um, it's turning the whole thing on its head. Uh, you said that two of the things that guided are this idea of reciprocity and mutual aid. Could you say a little more about that? I I think the I think the well I think that the idea of mutual aid in that um, is one that is not well developed enough in our society. Really, the kind of um, coming the kind of coming together that happens at the co-op or you know or happens in m several organizations <coughs> around Missoula um, that is based in in um, collectively working for one another and the benefits of um, of helping one another and helping <laughs> beyond even the limits of the co-op. So the idea is that um, collectively the sum of is, is greater, or, or the collectively what we produce there is greater than the sum of its parts. So the, uh, the ideas um, generated from the group um, spill out into the community in a way that benefits the entire community as well. And where did this whole idea come to you from? I know you said you'd spend some time living in a different country. <laughs> where was the inspiration for, for setting up this new model? Well, um, I, my, my original politicization and um, uh, awareness largely came out of time that I spent, <coughs> excuse me, in the jungle of southern Mexico living in an encampment with um, Basque separatists and communist Italians and various uh, nationalities in uh, seeking a sort of political utopia with the uh, Zapatistas. And um, I, and if for those, I mean, the Zapatistas are a rebel insurgent group for anyone who is not familiar with them that decided that they were tired of being neglected, tired of being, um, machine gunned down and tired of being driven off the lands that were they were um, ha had been living on and um, they assembled themselves in a very much horizontal structure so very much non-hierarchical the absolute um, antithesis of what we are um, doing here in this country and um, where they es established a, a society where there is rotating uh, representation um, that was equally shared amongst participants. Um, and the communities in, in Zapatista territory took care of, if someone fell ill, the other families would tend their cornfields. If, some, you know, if someone lost a family member, the, the, uh, the entire village would take care of that person's family. And um, it very much became quickly instilled in my sense of Justice. Oh, sorry. I'm a soft talker. Okay, so and then how has this view, how, how did that influence your decision to be involved in the Occupy movement, Occupy Missoula? Um, well, I, um, I have in, I guess in my own way, not to the extent that Daniel has, but 
um, dropped out, uh, dropped out, of <laughs> dropped out of certain parts of of our economy um, based on the fact that it it's a it's a total disaster. Our collective household has fallen in shambles, and um, and so, and I think that that's a pretty widely shared awareness, and so the opportunity to assemble. The opportunity to assemble ourselves in a horizontal fashion and to start learning the processes of real democracy and to start working towards listening to the people um, people in a real way and developing an economy that is participatory versus hierarchical and um, restoring what economy means, which means which is maintenance of our household and that we share it with other beings. Um, so that. Um, my, the Occupy movement was kind of like it was for so many people, um, just like, <laughs> finally, <laughs> <laughs> at last, so. I think what's really cool is that you were saying that when we talked earlier that the co-op is kind of a small scale model in pure democracy. And the Occupy movement is sort of a, a larger scale. Mm -hmm. And then to think, what if we actually could bring it to the, the biggest scale of all? Mm -hmm. I have one more question, it's kind of difficult. Um, you said the other day that our economic system is antithetical to spirituality. I wonder if you could comment on that some more. Daniel would do a better job <laughs> at that. <laughs> it was, well, um, the, t um, the timing of Mark asking me to participate in this was kind of sweetly serendipitous as I was driving through Daniel's home territory and um, Mark called me on the phone and asked me to participate. Um, and uh, when I started reading the book, I thought, you know, this is the, the piece that has been missing. Well, the piece that's missing a little bit in, in the co-op and the piece that's missing largely in Occupy because of people's phobias of touching upon religion and spirituality is that, you know, they just don't. You know, the separation of church and state, of course, is very sacred. And um, but to really delve into, you know, what's important to us, what is sacred to us, our family and our relationship to the earth and our relationship to one another. And um, when you, we, I mean, if we were really confronted with the with the consequences of our economy, um, we couldn't stand a look at ourselves you know <laughs> so it just seems like that that um without being very specific about um, none of these none of the world's spiritualities would um if we were actually acting on them if we were putting them into practice would this be um the way we'd be doing things so thank you that was beautifully said thank you Did you have anything else that you wanted to add that was on your notes? Mm, no. Okay. If, you, if you think of something, we'll come back to you. All right, I want to talk to Bob Giordano now. This is Bob here. Um, and we had a great conversation yesterday. I learned a couple of things about Bob. For instance, he hasn't owned a car in 15 years. And um, <laughs> Bob, you told me that one of your sort of greatest phobias or, or worst moments uh, is when you hear a mother in the street telling her child, get out of the street. Why is that? <laughs> Can you hear me? Um, yeah, that was one of the last thing I added when we were talking. I think you said anything else, and I had to put that in. <clears throat> when I hear that, I just... Closer to the mic. Can you hear me okay? There you go, yeah. Oh, you all right? Um, when I hear a mom or anyone, get out of the street... Um, I get really sad. I, I get angry because, you know, throughout time, the streets are what bring people together. It's our common resource. It's, it's a public right of way. And I think we've gone, it, it echoes a lot of the themes we've talked about. We've lost that common resource. And to yell, get out of the street with, you can see the fear in a parent's eyes that something terrible could happen. And sometimes it does. Why have we moved to this public resource becoming a fear when really it should be a joy. It, it should be where you meet people, where you linger, where you talk, where you 
run into somebody and it's a good thing to run into somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Not exchanging insurance cards and cursing and avoiding intersections like Reserve and Mullen or any other number of places in the community. So that, um, I'll just lead in that that's, that's kind of the impetus behind Missoula Institute for Sustainable Transportation. It's what is our common ground in this city and how do we move towards that where all people are welcome in that space? Yeah, one of the things that uh, Swelo has talked about and I write in the book is, you know, he gets hassled by cops as he's hitchhiking around and he says, the cops say, well, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm, I'm walking in America. <laughs> and this whole idea that the public space is for the public is something that's been um, kind of forgotten, I think, in the last couple of decades. And it's been so refreshing to, to get to know Bob and talk about this. Um, I was under the impression that Bob was a bike guy because he started his bike shop, but turns out that's not true. Can you tell us actually uh, what you were doing when you decided to start Free Cycles? <coughs> well, it wasn't um, anything to do with bikes. As I was in graduate school here at UM, resource conservation, and Steve Siebert, uh, professor, it was a, tan a tangent to a story. He mentioned that he came out of a bar over the weekend in Portland, and his, him and his brother hopped on two yellow bicycles, rode them across town, and just deposited them. So my ears, eyes, everything kind of <coughs> perked up. I was um, getting slightly disillusioned with um, the continual talk in graduate school, although I know that's what you got to do in graduate school. You talk and talk and talk and write and write. And that has its place, but I wanted to use my hands. And um, a lot of students were working on restoration, restoration, restoration. Uh, I wanted to work with my hands on a little bit more proactive. And this idea of just free yellow bikes sprung forward for a couple years. We, the true free cycle was just green bicycles, 50 of them, put out in the spring, let them run around town, do their thing, help people out. Um, some get abused. One I heard got put on fire and rolled into the river. <laughs> if only the green bikes could just, just speak their stories. <laughs> <coughs> and over those two years, about half would survive. But the natural demand, people would say, can I build my own bike? And we just started saying yes to everything. And, can you teach me how to fix it or can I teach you? And so it was a great learning experience and um, it's slowly evolved to our community bike shop on South First. Anyone can build a bike. I see many people in here who have built bicycles there or learned something or, or taught me and our other volunteers. So it's when, when we say it's a community bike shop, those two words are really important, the community part and the bike part. So let me back up. You said that a lot of your fellow grad students were talking about restoration restoration of what and how did that affect you well, well restoring um rivers that had been over polluted or a range land that had been over grazed and i think we have to restore as much as we can but we can't just sit there and restore 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 while the the reasons for restoration just keep continuing so I think it's very powerful in this community. People are restoring, people are talking, people are writing, and also being proactive uh, about what kind of community do we want to have for us, for the people who are going to be here after us. So uh, we, we outlined right yesterday a couple of the ways in which this is in, this free cycles is a creating alternative economy. You have people who work on their bike instead of paying someone to fix it or instead of paying a store to sell it to them. You have volunteers who are giving their time to help people learn how to do this. You have people who are donating bikes that would otherwise be thrown in a landfill and sit there for thousands of years. And you have people freely giving money in the donation box, which is what pays the rent. Um, tell me about what else, uh, what are the intangibles? What are the other benefits that come from having a, a community like store like this or a shop? <clears throat> well, it almost echoes the the public street in that this is a public place. I feel like we have um, lost some of our public places. Uh, we don't have a, a town square in Missoula. We have barely have places that you can feel welcome. Thank goodness, libraries, um, museums, um, there are parks. Uh, I, I think we need more places where people can gather without strict rules where you're going in 
buying something, leaving. And I think Missoula business is actually uh, better than that. I mean, there's relationships being formed all the time. And in our shop, please come, South First Street, drop in. All of you tomorrow, build bikes. <clears throat> we can do it. The place is a community gathering, and I like to see relationships. I like to see people you would not think would have much in common, and maybe if they spilled their beliefs to each other, they might turn from each other. But when the subject is, how can I fix this flat tire, um, and the person comes over and they hold hands together and take the tire off the rim, there's, there's something that they, you know, Daniel kind of mentioned that, there, there's, you forget the other obligations, you forget the debt and the credit, and it's just help each other out, and there's a mutual benefit to that. And I, I really like to, to see that and promote that and learn from that. So I went on the Free Cycles website, and here's where the three reasons it was started because the projections of future increased congestion air pollution, because the lack of community access to affordable bicycles and to broken bicycles being thrown away, all three of which are being pretty amazingly addressed by free cycles. But he didn't stop there. Uh, Bob started the Missoula Institute for Sustainable Transportation. And when I moved here seven years ago, I, s I started noticing these things that I hadn't seen other places. You know. Uh, roundabouts and bike lanes and bike paths and I said that's so cool that these things just happen I haven't even lifted a finger and this town's great <laughs> and it turns out someone lifted a finger do you want to talk about that a little bit <laughs> well a lot of people have lifted fingers and <clears throat> you don't know what's gonna happen <laughs> when you lift a finger others will lift fingers and you can lift your finger right after others lift fingers and <laughs> we could all lift many things with just a finger. <laughs> okay, I got, I got one more question for you. <laughs> and this is one of my favorite things. Um, yesterday you were telling me about um, you know, the difference about how our American cities are, are built on a grid versus maybe some other way they could be built. Could you tell us about that? Well, kind of what kicked it in gear was um, <clears throat> in graduate school I was able to, able to go over to Europe and find that freedom there is not having a car, and that's a challenge in this country, but it's, uh, it's being c becoming easier and easier. Uh, I took pictures out of a plane window at the cities there to look at how they were formed, and they're very organic cities, um, the way things curve and to the landscape and to the rivers, very stark to uh, even some progressive planner ideas in this country and elsewhere where it's the grid, line, 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 line line, 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 this way, right angles everywhere. And I was looking at these photos of European cities, and one looked really interesting. And uh, the more I studied it, the more I realized it was a human cell. Um, a slide had gotten mixed into mine from a doctor's <laughs> slides. So I tur returned it to a uh, Yellowstone photo, and they were happy because the doctor was missing the slide. <coughs> But it blew me away how cities are biomimicry. It's, it's a reflection of the human cell. And you can even go right on up to universal concepts and how things flow in curves. And it, they, they cycle and they, they move. And it's not this right angle stop and go. So I often t like to talk to doctors and people who work with the human body about, you know, what are you finding in there? Uh, are there anything that resembles stoplights in the human body? <laughs> um, and I thought, well, does the brain fire like a stoplight? And then doctor will think about it and say, well, no, not, not really. It's all about uh, movement and flow. So not just a roundabout, but city design. And I just want to encourage everyone to you know, be involved in your neighborhood and your community. And I, th I think we don't have to trash what we have today, but we can move towards something that's more in harmony with ourselves and with nature. All right. Very well said. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Like, um, when I said vision, I mean, like, it never occurred to me to think of, a, of a, the, the shape of our city in relation to the shape of our cells. And, like, when you start thinking in that abstract way, suddenly, like, it's, it's kind of like the same thing that Daniel was talking about with, you know, how does a, a raspberry bush get paid back from the grizzly bear? Um, 
I don't know, these, these are really exciting ideas to me and seeing people actually implement them is amazing. And uh, that brings me to our next panelist, uh, Christian Kreider. Um, why don't you start this by telling us what Imagine Missoula is and what it does. So, um, Imagine Missoula is yet another nonprofit <laughs> in a city that we, we have a lot of nonprofits here, and there's a lot of great nonprofits. I think one of the things that we noticed as I've been here five and a half years, um, as we sought to get involved uh, in nonprofits, one of the things that we noticed, actually, maybe step back a little, I'm also a pastor. And I think one of the things I listen to you guys talk that just strikes me, and I've seen this about both nonprofits and churches, is that a lot of them actually seem to embrace a lot of the same ideas that business does, which is very money driven. You know, in other words, I saw a lot of nonprofits that were actually running themselves, like where it was all about we've got to grow our budgets and add staff. And I was like, wow, um, we didn't have any money to really like give to and it's, I'm not saying that's bad but as a small community if you're trying to say hey we want to try to help out and we started to realize that a lot both nonprofits and churches kind of had this m money business economy and we were trying to do something that was much more community oriented where we could actually get our hands dirty and if we didn't have any money you could still like find somebody to help um, we realized that there might be somebody three doors down from me that you know needed a door fixed or needed help moving or something like that and what they would probably do is they would probably go online and find a nonprofit if it existed that service that need and they would go to the nonprofit and fill out paperwork and get qualified and a professional would show up and do it and the idea that we had was really what if we could just help them say hey there's a neighbor three doors down that could help you do that so it's really the Imagine Missoula is the idea of neighbors helping neighbors, um, uh, helping foster community, doing small things. So we fix, we mow lawns, we rake leaves, we fix um, doors. We do things like that that don't take a lot of expertise that most ordinary people could do if they just knew where the needs were. And so it works like you go on Facebook and you join the group and then what happens? Yeah, this is, it's been an interesting experiment in social networking, figuring out how do we use some of these tools like Facebook, the web, right. stuff like that. How do we communicate? Basically, you could think of it loosely as we kind of have a collective of people that say, hey, I'm interested. We use Facebook and email to kind of push needs out there where we go, we have needs this week. You know, there's an, we, we end up helping a lot of people that I would say their community is very thin. So a lot of elderly, um, single parents, those types of folks. And we, we kind of put things out and wait to see who says, I'd like to help meet that. Yeah, so this is alternative economy at work. You have people who are giving their hours with no expectation of getting paid or if even getting anything. And then you have people who need something and instead of spending money on it or sort of you know feeding into a big bureaucracy, they're just connecting with someone who will give freely and they can accept freely. It's pretty amazing in its simplicity. Um, so, Christian, you were a software programmer for 15 years. Yeah. Went to seminary and decided to start a church in Missoula. Why Missoula? <laughs> yeah, I've had an interesting career path. Um, when we came, I, first of all, when I came to Missoula, I had people in other towns. Like, I grew up in Billings. Not, I don't know if anybody's from Billings, nothing against Billings, but we had people who were like, why Missoula? And, and I'm sitting here, think, literally, as, as I'm listening to you, and I know some of you guys, I'm like, why not Missoula? <laughs> I mean, if, if you look around this room, I don't know many communities where you see this many really, really interesting people that would actually come out for something like this that are thinking about how do we do life and community together differently not just the way that everybody tells us we're supposed to do you know what i'm saying so i think that was something um and there were lots of people here that had given up on church which i like hanging out with them so 
So you came down, you built a big church, and you started having. Yeah, we don't have a we don't have a building. <laughs> they, we uh, we rent from the children's theater. That's a way of supporting the arts. Um, we'll probably never have a building because we'd rather put money elsewhere. So you told me that you spent, was it two years just interviewing people when you got here? We spent, we, we spent a lot of time, um, most of the folks who come to our church aren't from other churches. They've given up on church or they, have, you know, they can't believe they're back in a church. We figured if we were going to connect with those kinds of folks, and there's plenty of them here in Missoula, a lot of you are probably like that, we actually should like get to know them. And they probably knew a lot that we didn't know. So we came and just asked lots of questions. Um, my partner, Ryan, I think he sat down with you, Bob, early on and asked questions about free cycles. And we just asked a ton of questions, really figuring there's a lot that we don't know. So we probably should like listen and take notes. I was really interested by what you said were the two most common impressions that you got about Christianity. Well, yeah, one is we're hypocrites, um, which I think is pretty accurate, really. Like what Daniel said about you know taking the teachings of Jesus seriously. The reality is, none of us do that very well. So we really wanted to model a community that was based on authenticity, uh, no matter where you're at. And then the second one is really it's all about the money, and just what I said earlier. How many churches? Um, like it does take money to run a church, to you know, to to do church, but um, we think there's got to be a different, a, a better way of doing it. And so you said you get the church has agreed or has decided to give a ten percent tithe to the city. Tell us what that means. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what all our folks think about that. <laughs> um, we talk to people about giving. And I mean, just if you, I actually think Jesus asked way more than 10%, but you look in the Old Testament, you got this 10% baseline, kind of the tithe. And we said, man, if we're going to ask people to give money to the church, we should be willing as a church to give money back to the city. So the, this past year, we kind of made a decision among our leadership, we're actually going to give 10% of our budget every year to the city with no, like to things we're, we don't benefit from. So there's no strings attached. So... So nobody's revolted yet. <laughs> and so imagine Missoula is a secular nonprofit, but sponsored by a church. What motivates its members to do what they do? Yeah, that, the great thing about Imagine Missoula, it is, it's not a Christian nonprofit. It's, although spirituality is one of its core values, we want people, like, if you have spirituality, you're welcome to be open about it there. Just don't proselytize. If you don't, you're welcome to come be a part of it as well. I think the thing that I see that motivates, I think everybody's motivation is a little bit different, and that's actually very refreshing. We don't really spend time trying to figure out what people's motivation is. It's kind of like, here's a need, and if you'd like to meet it, that's great. And um, so. And so, what do you have a theory as to why, this big question, last question, do you have a theory as to why those basic teachings of Jesus have been lost in the shuffle of commercial Christianity? That, that's actually a really good question. The, um, it, you know, is it just that people don't know? That may be part of it. Um, in some ways, I think that, Daniel and I haven't talked about this, so I don't know if we'd agree or, I mean, I don't, but, but to me, I think fundamentally, there's something that makes it really hard for all of us to do the right thing. Like all of us really are attracted to money and we really are attracted to power and we don't treat people very well. I mean, I don't. And so like I look at that and I think this is where you start, I think all of the, I would say all of the religions, major religions agree in that diagnosis, like we got a problem. But where they diverge is in what do we do about it? And, um, I think this is where Christianity says something interesting. So, I actually lied. I have one more question. Can you tell us about the beer? Oh yeah, <laughs> this is um, we like beer. <laughs> Some people are like, "What are you doing? You know, don't you have a problem with beer?" And we're like, "If it's bad beer, we have a problem." Because <laughs> Jesus made wine, and it was the good stuff. So, um, one of the things that we did was. 
I went to Big Sky and asked the owners, like, I fully expected to have to go to a lot of breweries. Um, and I just said, you know, we would love to have you brew a beer, call it All Souls Ale, our church is All Souls, and, uh, but give all the profits to Imagine Missoula and support this nonprofit, which helps meet real needs. And they're like, nobody's ever asked us to do that before, let alone a church. And so they did it. This is the second year we've done it. It's an amazing, um, they're great beers. And there's only like 12 cases left out at Big Sky. So uh, uh, last year it generated about seven grand for Imagine Missoula, which was pretty cool. All right. Thank you. Okay. Lastly, but not least, uh, Josh Slotnick. We just talked this morning. Uh, we did. Um, Tell us, how is, the, how is the, what you're doing a, an example of alternative economy? Hmm. <laughs> wow. Uh, I, have a, I have a list here if you forgot. Okay. <laughs> can I just... Div <laughs> yeah, you can do it. Just go off. Yeah, just go off. Yeah, yeah. That, that's better. I'll just ring the bell in okay. 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I told him that would be the problem early on would be uh, getting me to stop. Uh, the first thing I want to say, I want to uh, go off on the raspberry and grizzly bear bit. Uh, and this ties right into what we do. And uh, I work for, the, for Garden City Harvest in the Environmental Studies Program, and I, I manage the peas farm. Um, you probably know that, so I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, what does the raspberry get out of the, uh, out of the relationship with the grizzly bear? The raspberry has a need. It need, needs to have its seed spread. Really importantly, I think the raspberry creates an opportunity for the grizzly bear to be necessary. And all of us, if we're going to follow on this little, this little analogy, all of us need to be necessary. Unfortunately, the way the world is structured, most of us, even those of us <coughs> who are financially successful and middle class and life is going good, are not actually necessary. And it leaves us feeling fairly empty. I think some of us, even the most successful, are not even necessary in our own lives. Think about that. Someone else creates all that you need, in a sense, most of what you are. I started doing this civic agriculture thing quite a long time ago. And when we started, I thought the best thing was that we were going to grow food for people who needed it. And the good food would help them out, and they would gobble it down, and, and life would be good. And, and to some degree, that happened. But that isn't the best thing. The best thing is actually farming together, the experience of growing food together, and it boils down to this sense of being necessary. I work with college students primarily, white kids of privilege. Why should I help them? <laughs> I'm not even going to address that. <laughs> In the environmental studies program, we have a handful of really compelling, intense brilliant professors and these students learn upside down and sideways how we've screwed up the world. And then what do they get to do? They get to write a paper about it for some middle-aged person to read and hand back to them. This is a fairly unfulfilling experience. <laughs> <laughs> at a farm, at the peace farm, in small groups, these students do humble work together, on their hands and knees, digging in the dirt, weeding carrots, beets, potatoes, etc. And they can stand back from what they did and see the obvious necessity for their efforts, and also see tangible results from what they did. It wasn't just that they were needed, they were needed to do something that was of value. And there's some magic that happens in this. People get to experience their own sense of personal power, that they could actually make some real change in the world, be it ever so humble. And I think the humble part is really important here. The humble part is important because when people work together on their hands and knees in the dirt, the typical barriers that separate them erode away. If you're weeding carrots across, if you're weeding a bed of carrots with someone, you're, sit you're squatting in the earth across a bed from someone for four hours. By the end of the four hours, you know where they grew up, you know where they went to high school. If you do this sort of thing every day for three months, you know everything about each other. By the end of the summer at the Peace Farm, the students are all wearing each other's sweatshirts. 
which is kind of symbolic of something. So they show up in the morning, and even in the summertime, it's cold. They take off their sweatshirts, and then they leave them there because they're 20 years old. <laughs> and they come back the next day, and they put on each other's sweatshirts. They become this little tribe. They experience not just their own sense of personal power, but they experience what it's like to belong to a group, to be needed. And that experience of understanding your own ability to change things in the world and to belong to a positive, optimistic, functional, successful group, you combine those things and it's a transformational experience and people are changed by it. And that's the, that's the biggest thing that we create, not so much the food. And we found after doing this for a few years that this wasn't exclusive to white kids of privilege, that it works for almost anyone. I'll go on. I'll say one last thing. Do you want me to stop? No. Okay. <laughs> you looked a little exasperated. No, no, I'm not, no not at all. I, was, I, I'm, I don't think you should stop. Okay. Well, I'll do one last bit, and then, then I'll stop. And this goes back to this principle uh, of ecology and the grizzly bear and the raspberry. I was just feeling unnecessary. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, wrote, you wrote a great book, man. <laughs> Be proud. <laughs> So a bunch of years ago, uh, my buddy Tim Ballard, who was uh, working with me at the Peas Farm, we were talking about this. What happens with, this, with these kids over the course of the summer and trying to get a handle on this magic? And it really is kind of magic. They just get a taste of it in spring and fall. I see some of my students here, and they'd be going, like, what are you talking about? Summer, that's the deal. Because they're all there for a big chunk of time. Uh, my friend Tim had been working with teenagers in this, uh, it used to be called Hoods in the Woods. I don't know if I still call it that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and he kind of wondered out loud, well, sure, it works for these white kids of privilege, but would it work for people who really are facing some more serious obstacles? And Tim designed this program called Youth Harvest that my friend Lori Strand, uh, Lori Strand Bridgman, uh, runs now. So we get a handful of uh, teenagers. Some of them come from youth drug court. Some of them come out of youth homes. All these kids face horrible obstacles, primarily the fact that their families have imploded in some way. These kids work side by side with the peace students. We integrate them into the summer community, and they get to experience the sort of thing I was talking about as well, but understanding their own personal necessity and belonging to a group. But where it really got great, and here's the ecology part, was when we linked them up with seniors, old people, who are living in, oh, not a, I keep getting the names wrong, uh, uh, subsidized housing, low-income housing for seniors. So you have two of these two separate groups, and like the bear and the grizzly, the, the bear and the raspberry, through the way that they live, they actually create a niche for one another. The older people had been forsaken by all of us. We put them over here, especially poor old people. What do they really need? They really need to be tended. They need to be cared for. They need to be reminded that they're still alive. Then over here, you have these kids, teenagers who've screwed up. They are in the way. They're a problem. What do they need? They need exactly the opposite. They need to not be a problem. Not for us, but for themselves. They need to feel necessary. They need to be part of something good. And over here, we got those old people that need to be tended. Do you see where this is headed? So twice a week, these teenagers harvest vegetables from the peas farm and from the orchard gardens farm in Sarah Bordas, the farmer is back there. And they scoop up this food and they put it in a big red panel van with a very cool logo on it. And they drive the food off to these, these uh, low-income housing for seniors and they set up little mock farmer's markets. And then they sell the food at deeply subsidized prices. And we accept the old people, wic old people coupons that the federal government gives out for farmer's markets. And I know there's a better name for it, but that's what I call it. I don't think anybody would really be offended. Can you buy, buy an old person with one of those coupons? No, no, you're, you're breaking the momentum here, Mark. It's the best part. It's coming up now. So I've witnessed this. I've gone along. This isn't my program. I'm not the boss of it. I, I, my fingerprints aren't on it, but I've gotten to go watch. So you have these teenagers standing behind a table about this big, covered in, oh, we had arugula and oh, oh, potatoes and carrots and beets and tomatoes, and they set up and they have a time. Like, oh, we're, you know, we're not going to start till 2 o'clock, so they're setting up. And meanwhile, behind a door, there's a bunch of these seniors, and they're getting ready. <laughs> and the door isn't opened yet. And they open the door, boom, and they come out in their walkers, and they're going as fast as they can to get to the table. <laughs> so you've got 
older ladies and walkers going as fast as they can so they can meet up with a kid who two weeks ago was smoking weed. <laughs> so they can have a conversation about tomato sauce. <laughs> That's ecology. <laughs> That's a social ecology where these groups, through, the vir through virtue of who they are, create a space for the other. And the medium for that is food and farming. That's the best product we've got. Thank you. It's a great vision. It's a beautiful vision. Thank you. Uh, let's hear it for, all, for everyone who's been up here. So, uh, and now we have questions. So this would probably be a good time if, you, if you're late to go for the babysitter or something. Or if you, can, if you have to leave, you can do now, do so now without any shame. <laughs> and, um, and then if you don't have to leave, then you can stick around until Molly tells us we have to leave. And we can uh, answer questions and you can ask questions to anyone up here. Does anyone have one they want to start with? Yes, right here. Oh wait, we're going to do a microphone for this. Hold your question. Okay. Let's hear it. My question is to you. What, um, what was the purpose behind the book? Was it because you knew Daniel and he had no money? Or did you want to write some kind of treatise about the money system, period? Okay, the question was why did I write this book? Because I knew Daniel or because I wanted to write about the money system? I'd say it was more the second thing. I, I knew Daniel, but not very well at all. I hadn't seen him in 10 years. And he had scrunchy teeth. He had bad teeth. I was afraid of him. <laughs> <laughs> His teeth have been fixed since then. But these are these ideas that I had <laughs> always wrestled with myself. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, been a, I'd lived in my car for a while. I'd been done the hoods in the woods. I'd lived outside. I had... Uh, been a volunteer at the Garden City Harvest. I mean, I'd done a lot of these things halfway, or maybe even less than halfway. It's like Christian said, I didn't really think that I was a, that great of a person, or at least not great enough to write a book about myself and, and talk about how I've, you know, volunteered at the garden and, like, um, recycled and <laughs> rode my bike and stuff like that. <laughs> And then, uh, so then when I started reading about Daniel, I realized that he was this sort of walking, talking allegory, or he was this, his, he was living the beliefs that, that I didn't feel like I was, but that I kind of wanted to. And that made a, a great story opportunity, because that way I could, instead of like, you know, writing a term paper or an essay about sustainability and, you know, all of these big words that, that kind of put us all to sleep, um, I could actually write someone's life story who, who forced us in a dramatic way, in a narrative way, to think about these things. Yeah. Yes? Um, I, really, I really enjoy the idea of money being an addiction, yet somehow only existing <laughs> cerebrally. <laughs> so oh, okay. you know, laptop users, your laptop must be turned into the accounts desk in the next two minutes to avoid any money. <laughs> 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 There's a voice in our heads. There's this voice that seems to be broadcast um, that says that money is important, money is what value is. And, um, but it's not only addiction to that as a, uh, as a means of getting things that we need. There's also this addiction to convenience and this addiction to um, the opinions of others. And I see those as really big stumbling blocks to getting yourself into a position where you can live a life like Mr. here. And I was wondering if he would comment on overcoming those so yeah, if you didn't hear the question that was, in addition to an addiction to money, it seems like we also have an addiction to convenience and a, a, a real concern about what people think of us. And I think specifically what you're saying is, what if you lived in a cave, what would your neighbors think? <laughs> so and that's actually something that Suelo talks about a lot. Thanks, Drew. I was, Drew had me on his radio show Sunday morning 
on the college radio station, and I felt really grateful for that. It was it was really good. Um, yeah, I think basically the the uh, the point of living this way is to live in the moment, in the present, and to not have wants. To realize that everything that we need is in the present moment, um, in time and space. And we've lost faith in that principle. We, our minds are always going somewhere else, wanting something else. And the hardships of life, the inconvenience of life, isn't necessarily the present circumstances, it's thinking of something that could be better somewhere else. And we're never going to be content until we're content in the present moment. Um, it's a simple principle. It's, it's that again is a principle of all th the religions. It's um, not to desire something else. Like when I think when I'm in an uncomfortable position, when I look within, I realize what's really making this uncomfortable or inconvenient is not the physical circumstances that I'm in. It's my mind thinking, wow, something else could be better than this. And that's just life 101. <laughs> so. Yeah, right here. Abby Hoffman uh, encouraged people to steal from the pillars of the pig empire <laughs> to <laughs> bring it down. And uh, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, that's a shady area. Because um, <laughs> you could call stealing... Um, also the way nature works, it's like when you see an animal, you, like a lion sees a wildebeest and is hungry and goes and takes that wildebeest. Um, and the thing that m puts it in balance is the lion only takes exactly what he needs. I feel like bottom line, if we only take what we need, it's part of the balance. But on the other hand, we are in a culture where um, you know, I, ha I, I have friends who believe that stealing is okay, and I myself d don't do it, but I'm open to it. If I were really hungry and there's like a f store full of food, and that's my meal, I might do it. But, um, but on the other hand, I feel like it could create more problems. Like we are thinking creatures, we humans, and it would create conflict in someone else which would snowball into more conflict and more like vengeful thinking. And I feel like part of the reason of living this way is to do away with vengeful thinking and anything that creates vengeful thinking. and. Also, I've never felt the need to steal because everything I need is in the, it, it's a lack of faith in the, that everything I need will come as I need it. But on the other hand, I feel like when we take more than we need, this is real stealing. Any of us who takes more than we need, we're stealing. Others are going to get less than they need. Corporations are stealing. It's very, very obvious. We have a whole nation here that's dependent on underpaid workers in overseas sweatshops. To me, that's stealing. And what we're doing to the rainforest is stealing. And to put the focus on an individual who's hungry who goes to a store and takes something and call that stealing, you know, we have to get our perspective straight. Or taking from a dumpster. 
Um, I've had many, I've had people many times threaten to call the cops because I'm stealing from a dumpster, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so. And you do, you, one fact I came across in the research of this book is that we throw away in America 40% of the food. And it doesn't matter what your ethical beliefs are, that's wrong. Um, question on the, on the aisle, yes. Yeah, and I know you talked a lot about living in the present, but I'm wondering if you have a vision for the trajectory of your life over the next few decades. You're in your 50s, right? Yeah, so I'm soon to be 51. Oh, yeah. So in terms of age-related diseases, your parents expressed concern about your health and whatnot in the book when they're no longer there. So how do you see that unfolding? I have no idea how my life is going to unfold. <laughs> and honestly, I don't worry about it. Um, you know, I, I think of things that could happen, like visions of the future, like everybody does. But um, I feel like my best insurance for the future is to live fully in the present, my, my best investment in the future and to to worry about what could or should happen is a worse illness than what could or should happen um, and this is where I also would get into the mystical spiritual supernatural thing <laughs> is And, and, and this is a basic teaching of, of uh, Jesus, sufficient for today is the evil thereof. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to put on. Um, don't think about what you're going to say or do in the future. It'll come when it comes. Cross that bridge when you cross it. And, th and this is the way all creatures on earth live except us. It's like how many animals and like outside of our wall of commercial civilization, how many animals have an insurance policy? <laughs> and what if what did we creatures do for zillions of years before this little teeny tiny speck called commercial civilization hit the scene? And this is something else that we need to think about is if you look You look at, um, let's, let's just compare commercial civilization with wild creatures. How many malnourished or obese creatures do you see? How, how much mental illness do you see? Like us with, again, us with our medical knowledge, our intense education, are we really better off? Like. Look at Somalia, look at the U.S., look at obesity, look at mental illness. It's, it's epidemic. And it, it's the same principle again. The more we try to create balance, the more we stumble. The worse balance. Like we're trying to, basically the philosophy of our civilization is to eliminate death. <laughs> and to eliminate the negatives. But positive and negative, yin and yang, are the universe. That is the immutable law of the universe. And we can eliminate the negatives for a little bit, and then they're going to backlash on us in full force. We have mass poverty. We have overpopulation. We have war. It's, it's unbearable. We've, we've created unbearable suffering. And then we talk about nature being cruel. Um, just a reminder, we do have uh, other panelists ready to, to field questions. <laughs> just throwing that out there. Yeah, back there. That, yeah, you with the hat. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of what you guys are talking about, a lot of it goes back to the one quote that you mentioned 
far as like being the change we wish to see in the world. And she touched on like years down the road in your life. But how would and this is open to anyone, like any of the panelists that want to answer it, any and all. But how would you guys take this, like all the information and everything that you mentioned, how would you apply that towards like bringing a, another life into this world and raising it? Yeah, I, I don't have any, I don't haven't brought any life into the world yet, so maybe, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm guilty of doing it three times. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> That's all we need. Um, I think we should, with, with your kids, live the way you wish the world was even though it isn't there yet and your own life is better in so doing so if in my world is around food and farming so you could say well i wish that we could have local food or i wish we could actually sit down and have a real meal and this is so terrible that we can't we'll just do that and the it, with food it's pretty simple but as soon as you start attempting to live the life you want your life gets better and you can share that with your kids. And I think they get to see that you believe it's possible. That's it. I'd like to know, Daniel, you know, how would that, how would you, like, I guess I'd like to know how, if you, how would this work for you if you had family? Yeah, this is a question that comes up a lot too, because I'm single. I have no kids, no dependents, um, and often people with family ask me, well, it's easy for you to do, and, and that's true. I, I'm experimenting, I might as well, if I don't have dependents, I might as well ex experiment with finding a better way. Um, naturally, I don't expect everybody to do what I do, live in a cave, but probably if I had a family, I would look for a communal situation like I feel like in community it, it goes back to that we can live without money um, but I would love for people with families like somebody with dependents to experiment and show us what you come up with because I don't have all the answers Do any of the other panelists want to respond to that? I, I, I Just, this is one of the, th I've got three kids, so same boat. Mine are in college now. Makes me feel old. Um, yeah. So the end's in sight, hopefully. They'll be ready to move out and pay their own way. Anyway. Um, no, as I was reading this, Daniel, that was one of the things I thought, because there's part of this that resonates with me wanting to like go do crazy things that don't make sense. Uh, but it does change when you have, like for me, when I have a wife and, and kids, um, I find myself going, I'm not sure, like it's one thing to put myself at risk, but it, it, I don't know that I would, I, I think I'm less inclined to put my wife and kids at risk. But as I thought about it, I, th I think maybe stepping back, the thing I came away from, and I appreciated this so much as I've talked to you a little bit and read the book, is what I see in Daniel is somebody who's actually really wrestling. In other words, being very, very intentional about how he does what he does. And the thing that actually resonates with me, kind of going, okay, I may not do what Daniel does, but if all of us were a lot more intentional thinking how could I do something and, and try to instill that in my kids, whether it's a little thing or whether it's a really big thing, I think this world would be a better place if all of us stopped just drinking the Kool-Aid. I mean, everybody's kind of like, hey, you got to grow up, get a job, and, you know, get a car and get a house and pay the bills. And I think there's something very healthy with all of us being a lot more intentional. So that would be kind of my answer is maybe we don't all have the same, you know, specifics, 
But if all of us were much more intentional, I think there's ways with families that we can all be more intentional in being less money oriented. Uh, Christian, I'm just assuming when you stopped being a software developer and became a, a pastor in the Missoula church that has no oh. building, you took a pay cut. <laughs> was that, were you afraid for the sake of your kids? No, it was kind of like we sat down and told them, you know, all your college money, we just spent that on seminary. So um, you're on your own. And it, what's been cool is actually seeing our kids, like this is something, seriously, as a parent, there's a lot of expectation that I realized I was carrying around looking at other parents who are like, you're going to pay for your kid's education, right? And it's like, wow, is that actually, you know, like where's that come from? That's not in the Bible. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm kind of one of those Bible guys. And, and I think one of the things that I've seen is, you know, like I've got a son who's working in a coffee shop and paying his way through the U. And he's living at home. And it's like, wow, that's actually really, it's working out. I didn't have, you know, it's, it's so... Um, yeah, I think I've been encouraged just to see that it hasn't been the end of the world. All right. Um, you with the, right there with the beard. <laughs> yeah. Um, this question is for Daniel. And <clears throat> Daniel. The library is closed. <laughs> 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 you know, Daniel? Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, We're breaking all the laws. Um, I almost write my question. Everybody up there, except Daniel, has, is involved with an organization that they started, right? Because that's how they wanted to see out their vision. Um, but Daniel's just living. And so I'm wondering, Daniel, if you have a project, a goal, you know, other than not doing something, <laughs> um, <clears throat> to enact some change? Or do you see your life, and the fact that we're all in this room listening as that goal and that change? Um, yeah, that's a pretty good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, like the first few years of doing this, I, um, uh, basically felt like, well, I'm just going to live in the world. Like, it's basically an experiment and a learning process for me. And um, it's like phase one, it's like school. And then after that, maybe I'll have something that I can share with other people. And I guess that's happening automatically right now. But, um, but also, um, Like, I, I started in contact, email contact, with, for several years with this Mark Boyle in England. He he gave up money, I think it's like three, maybe four years ago now, I forget. But he he started out, it was, it was very program-oriented, but he he had media behind him, and, and he had plans to write a book after his year without money, which he did called The Moneyless Man, I think. And um, he was going to do it for a year and then give it up, maybe. But after his year, he decided, well, I think I want to continue on with this. And then the proceeds from the book he would use to build an intentional community to buy land, which he, he already did, and he's in that process. And I started feeling like... A, part of me was like feelings of inadequacy like well maybe I should be doing some kind of a program thing you know it's like I'm just hanging out <laughs> you know <laughs> you know and, and then sometimes people come and visit me and they want to learn some things about moneyless living and we just hang out <laughs> you know <laughs> and <laughs> I guess it just, it, again, I just feel like it's all where our heart is. Like, I've, I've, I've gotten involved in farming projects and, and um, did stints of work at different organizations in Moab and around. 
but um, but again, I, I just feel like a lot of what we do in, in this culture is too much work and too much busybodiness. And then if, if more people just hung out, we'd have more time for each other which is what people really need and really crave. It's like, this is something I, like I, I did social work before I gave up money. I was, I worked in a homeless shelter, a few homeless shelters, a women's shelter, and I was a caseworker for Traveler's Aid. And, and I'm not saying all of that work was bad, but a lot of what I was doing, I was feeling disillusioned about it because I was, I would go home, like, again, I'd work, like, from nine to five in social work, and one of the laws of social work is you don't get personally involved with your clients after five o'clock. They're no longer your friend after five o'clock. You see them in the streets, they're an acquaintance or whatever, you can say hi or whatever, but and the whole idea of prostitution kept coming, that, that same thing, prostitution kept coming up. Wow, I'm a prostitute. I'm paid until five, and after five, I'm exhausted anyway. I don't really want to have personal relations with people. Like I'd walk, walk through the bad part of Denver to get to my apartment, and homeless people would come up to me and want help or whatever. And in my mind, I was like, get out of my face. I've been helping people like you all day long. And then I'd go back to my apartment, and the neighbor would rap on the door and say, well, you want to hang out and have a beer or whatever? And I'd like, no, I'm too tired. I'm going to go to bed or watch TV or something. And I realized I'm loving everybody except my neighbor. And that's where culture is set up. And I... I was sending money to different organizations overseas or whatever, like um, children's funds or whatever. And, uh, and I'm not saying those things are bad, and I don't want people to stop doing that if you're doing that. But I was using those things as a replacement for just hanging out with people, loving my neighbor as myself loving everybody except my neighbor and that and we don't think about that it's like the thing that humans need the most isn't stuff and money those things are important but it's just hanging out with people and i feel like we need to do more of that <laughs> Okay. Philip Burgess. All right. Uh, so I'm going about, to about to take a question, but I, I just thought of something from um, that. that I, when you asked me why I wrote the book, um, you know, I, sp I spoke earlier when I first started tonight about, you know, we feel everyone knows, or almost everyone except Wall Street knows that we have a problem with our financial system, our money system in this country, and we all feel so powerless to do anything about it because we're all part of it. And the first email that I wrote to Daniel when I set out to write this book and to ask him if he wanted to, to participate, I told him that he reminded me of that guy, that famous photo of the guy standing in front of the column of tanks going into Tiananmen Square in China because, um, you know, that guy in the, in, the, in the photo, he didn't actually stop the tanks, right? Like five minutes after the picture was taken, they came in. And we don't even actually remember probably what they were protesting that day. Um, but the icon remains in that photo, and it's this inspiring image of the power that we each have if we're willing to stand up against insurmountable forces. And that's what's so inspiring to me about the way that Daniel's living, even though he's not founding a group or a movement is that it's that singular act of civil disobedience of saying like, I'm not gonna participate and I'm gonna stand in front of the tanks of our financial system. That was to me what, what I found so inspiring about his, the way he's doing it. Um, 
I did want to know if, if anyone else on the panel wanted to talk about that being on the other side and, and being in charge of a movement or a group or a nonprofit and what that's like. Or not. <laughs> oh, okay, Bob. <laughs> well, often I feel like uh, the community bike shop, let's put it on a hay wagon, uh, go into parks, go into apartment buildings, go push it down the street and just have our, have our community bike shop um, really on wheels and go to where the need is and just hang out with people and build bikes. You know, and after reading this book, that urge got a little stronger. <laughs> um, but, but for me, it, it, it is a little bit of a conflict, so I try to keep one foot in, in the, what we call the reality, and there's programs and rent to be paid and missions and goals and objectives and all, all that, but, but also balance that with, um, with the hanging out. And it, it just struck me about the, what you're just talking about with the, um, the relationships. And I had said earlier, that's what we try to, to do at, at Free Cycles. But, you know, it does strike me um, with these social programs, we build uh, a lot of relationships. Um, and sometimes I think it's, it's actually too many. That is, what is the right line of quantity of relationships versus, versus quality? And we may be a lot of times spreading ourselves thin and sometimes I feel that um, and think okay well, you just fight through that a little more and um, stick with it and and it all works out but uh, I really take to heart your message of of the moment and um, being being present I think that's that's a very important thing uh, let's see Josh you had a, a, a question or I noticed that Philip had his hand up I want to make sure he got his question all right Phil Philip. Well, it just seems, I had a Spanish kid tell me one time, he loved America, he spent a lot of time in Spain. And he said he loved America, he said, but we worship safety, <laughs> we worship security. And it occurs to me, just listening to all of you here, and you know, all of you on the panel, that you all made, uh, you know, each of you has made a decision regarding safety in your lifetime, whether you consciously made that or, or just drifted into it, but you decided to put aside a certain amount of safety in terms of your goal in life. You know, you, and, and I think making the decision about that, what co at what price security, when we talk about money, you know, piling up money is just an attempt at some sort of infinite, endless sort of security. And I guess, you know, on one hand, I like to commend all of you um, I'm making a decision to sacrifice a certain amount of, of security in, in the interest of other uh, priorities. And, and, but I also have a comment on, from my own experience that what happened with me and what I'm hearing that there, there's, when you give up, the more security you give up, you risk, you risk life, you risk bad things happening. You know, when you give up on insur insurance, you give up on saving. But there's also a crazy kind of spiritual uh, freedom, uh, transcendence that can occur when you do that. And uh, it sounds to me like some of you would at least have, have had that experience. Good for you. That sounded like the answer that we didn't, that wasn't even the question, Thanks. that was great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did anyone want to re reply or respond? I know Kate told me that you stopped, having, didn't want to have a retirement because you didn't believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't believe in insurance either. But I, well, I was just, I guess, I, it, it, as Phil was talking, I was, uh, I was like, I think Janet Joplin said something like that once. Um, <laughs> but um, but um, yeah, I think, the, um, I think that across the board, it, from everybody who has spoken here, that we have found that the real value is not in like, and not in our, 
you know, productivity or, or you know, quantifiable gains that, uh, well, how, you know, how many bikes we've built necessarily, although that's really awesome, or how much food we've given away or how, how much people have saved on their food, but really the, the quality is the kind of community that has been built makes us all rich. And, um, and when you sort of extrapolate that out to um, how much we support one another and how much we rely on one another, that, um, you know, you can, we can all turn to one another and say, you know, somebody just turned up the treadmill and I'm getting off. <laughs> like, how about you and I and everybody else in this room get off the treadmill? And so anyway, there's a lot of value in that. And there's a lot of value in having that community. You know, I hope you have a big enough cave sometime. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> you know, in having that community stand with you, and that was part of, I mean, that was part of becoming, for me, becoming involved in Occupy, being like, look, we could all get off at once. And, and then it would stop. And it would stop. <laughs> yeah. um, where's Molly? Do we have more time? Okay. Um, let's do a couple more questions and then uh, maybe we'll stop and then uh, some people on the panel might stick around and answer more questions and if others have to leave then they will. In the red, in the way back. Um, I kind of have a comment as well as, I don't know whether it's actually a question either, but my mother grew up in the depression. She raised 10 of us kids in a 10150 trailer with no running water. We got bear meat to eat from neighbors who liked to shoot them. So that's what we ate. We had a huge garden. So I read this book, and she was very, very, well, she would have called it religion because that's the word she knew. But she and God were tight. I mean, Jesus was her best friend. And, um, and that's the way I was raised, which is why the book caught my attention for the fundamental issue. But my mother was a product of her generation. And it seems to me that we owe a debt of gratitude to those who have already lived this path. And I have to laugh at my kids, and I'm a new grandmother. I have one who's 10 months old and one that's on the way. And I just look back and go, my God, my mother was right. I'm turning into my mother. And the first time I thought that, I cried. Now I'm very proud because everything you guys have talked about has been done. We just need to remind ourselves to shift back to that. Because it's only been in the recent history that we've gotten way up here in the, at least this part of the country because I was born in western Montana. So I think we just really need to look at the fact that we know how to do what needs to be done. We just have put it away for a while, and now we're finally coming back. I, I absolutely agree. I think that we say things casually, like, oh, you know, my parents were born in the Depression, and, and so, and that wasn't that long ago. But I think that this country has changed, I mean, like a pendulum swing within the past 40 years to where it's almost unrecognizable to people who were in the Depression. And, you know, when you're alive in history, you can't see its, its arc or its sweep. And we don't know where we are. And so it's hard to remember that, that just a generation ago, things were very different. But here's one example that just blew my mind as I researched this book. You know, we are also used to paying 20% interest on credit cards and 10% interest on our cars and payday loans and high mortgages on our houses. Um, you know, that's called, the charging of interest is called usury and it's a, a sin in the Bible. It was banned by the Catholic Church for a thousand years. I mean, if you charged interest, you were excommunicated from the church and you could not be buried in a Christian cemetery. It was that serious of a crime. And even in America, which we think, oh, it's always been capitalist. It's never been followed those teachings. Usually, which was defined as charging more than 10% interest, <coughs> was outlawed. Can anyone guess when that stopped? It's 1980. That wasn't that long ago. And we've already forgotten that. We, 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 we get our 22% uh, interest penalty on our credit card. And we just go, oh, that's the way it is, because that's the way it's always been. 
but these are just like absolutely, um, uh, I mean, <laughs> like diabolical sort of like uh, money lending systems that have become accepted. And, you know, we can't even remember, um, uh, we did a reading in, in California, and this guy said, when I was, he was in the Navy in World War II, he said, you got, you got in trouble if you, if you charge interest to your shipmate on the ship. Um, the point being, absolutely, we, a, lo a lot of this stuff isn't new. I think the reason these people are, are doing what they're doing is because the pendulum has swung so far towards individualism and uh, consumption and greed that we have to basically found a nonprofit to remind people things that maybe our parents or grandparents knew growing up. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, so my question is kind of for Daniel. And um, so I think like a lot of us have thought or had those fleeting thoughts of maybe giving it all up, but we haven't acted on those kind of impulses. But you actually acted on that impulse. You crossed that line. <laughs> And um, <coughs> I'm just wondering, what made you cross that line? What was that thought that like pushed you to actually leave your money behind? And then also on top of that, what, how has um, living the way that you are living changed your relationships with your family and friends? Um, yeah, for me, like giving it all up was was actually a gradual process that happened through the 90s like with peace pilgrim i don't know if you've all heard about peace pilgrim she was way more radical than i she gave everything up and traveled with didn't even carry a backpack i usually carry a backpack and sleeping bag and extra sets of clothes but she just had the clothes on her back and she just like went from conventional mother I think grandmother to walking the US for 30 years without money back and forth across the continent um, it was like this major radical change but for me it was just a gradual process like like we were talking about it I was thinking about this stuff since childhood off and on and then I was dealing with like I went to the Peace Corps and I thought strongly of it there I saw cultures that lived without money and what money did to them I could see before my eyes what it did that that was in the uh, late 80s I was in the Peace Corps a couple of years in Ecuador and um, then coming back to the states i went into severe depression and that, that was when i was working doing social work and i worked with the homeless and i was terrified of the idea of becoming homeless thinking wow there's this fine line between me and them and uh, yeah it was a gradual process and then when i a friend of mine invited me to moab utah to visit so I went to visit and ended up staying and that's when I started whittling down my possessions and feeling like this was my time for healing I feel like Moab in the desert is a very healing place and it was a gradual process of giving up unnecessary thoughts most of which were negative like things that I was clinging to and realizing that unnecessary thoughts and unnecessary possessions are one and the same thing integrally related and as I gave up it happened simultaneously giving up unnecessary thoughts and unnecessary possessions and just feeling this gradual sense of liberation and um, then my trip then I went on a trip to Alaska for a couple years before I gave up money and s observing nature and living off the land and the principles of that that that's when i really felt like wow i can i could live without money but it took me a couple more years and then i went to india thinking i would go to india and be a sadhu and 
I went to Thailand first, actually, on my way to India, and ended up in a Buddhist monastery for a month. And that was a life-changing experience. And then to India and observing sadhus. And then finally, um, I didn't even plan it. I, got to, I went to Dharamsala, where the Tibetans are, and heard the Dalai Lama speak. And that kind of cinched it for me. He said, you know, you Westerners come over here to learn Tibetan Buddhism or whatever, whatever Eastern religion, and that's all fine and good. And some of you are supposed to do that. You know, some of you become Tibetan monks or whatever. He says, the majority of you go back to where you came from. And... You know, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, but you f have wisdom in your own traditions and your own culture and go back to where you're planted. And, and that's when it dawned on me, wow, I could... I have all... Th the treasures are back where I came from. And it's the most materialistic, one of the most materialistic nations on earth and the real challenge would not be to be a sadhu in India, where it's culturally acceptable, but to go back to the U.S. and do it and use my own tradition, go back to my own roots. So, and that's what I did. And then it took me the year of 2000 to give up my last pennies. So how about one more question from the gentleman in yellow, and then we will uh, disperse, and we can, Daniel and I can sign books, and everyone will be here to answer more questions, or maybe they won't be, but some of us will be. Yeah. I think it's important uh, to remember that Christ did not have a job, <laughs> did not hide money in a hole, didn't have a program. Um, <laughs> 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 years of history, just being here, moving around amongst people and doing whatever good he could. So the guy who leaves $30 in a telephone booth, and I don't think of Jesus, by the way, <laughs> but, but he leaves the money there and he walks away and he lives up to that promise to himself and influences in time, God knows how many people. No one comes here tonight, no one reads the book, that, that will not uh, escape thinking about what he did in terms of our own choices. We won't make a, an important choice without remembering not only uh, Daniel, but this book. And the book, by the way, is very well written. It, it makes a real positive impact on a culture that has been imprisoned by money and most recently uh, it, uh, it, it's almost like we're in solitary confinement <laughs> with our attachment to money. It's a hideous possibility. Uh, Bruno Bettelheim, the famous psychiatrist who, who basically invented the word autism, claimed that we invented that disease, that it didn't exist before, and that he believes little kids responded to the stress and insanity of our culture in that way that we collectively created autism when it probably didn't exist before. Anyway, I want to commend Daniel, absolutely. I've thought about these things my whole life. And then I get a book about it. That's all really all you needed to do. If you don't do another damn thing with your lives. <laughs> you. Mark wrote the book. <laughs> and then finally, I just want to recommend two other books that are sort of twin sisters to this one. One of them is called Cave in the Snow. It's about an English woman who was the first Tibetan Buddhist, not sanctioned Tibetan Buddhist. She lived in a cave for 12 years in the Himalayas. Wonderful book. 
she started, since then she started a, a, a nunnery in Canada. Uh, but it's a story about a woman who lived way the hell up in the Himalayas, living almost exclusively on rice and turnips. And she would only go down to see her teacher in the summertime. And for 12 years, had almost no contact with other people. She said, I don't recommend this. Most people would go crazy. <laughs> but there's a wonderful lesson in that book. And another one, more pedestrian, is the book... Nickel and Dime, uh, a, 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 a Florida journalist who has money, living with her husband in a big suburban house, decided she would travel around the country and work in minimum wage jobs just to see what the hell that was all about. So she worked for Mary Maids and worked as a, um, uh, you know, in fast food restaurants and worked in an office for seven dollars an hour. It's a wonderful book about coming down and mixing with just folks who live out day to day the slavery that we've all been handling. <laughs> Thank you. What was, the, what was the name of that first one? Snow Cave? The first one is Cave in the Snow. In the snow. I found it in a, you wouldn't find it, you can get it on the internet, but you'll find it like in religious bookstores in the Buddhist section. Wonderful book. Tenzin Pamo. Yeah, one Even in the snow. Um, well, I just want to, uh, I think that's a great place to, to close. Um, and I just want to thank, again, uh, well, first of all, everyone who I see in these audience who I recognize and who I don't. This has just been so great to, s to have this kind of turnout and interest. And specifically, I want to thank Molly for putting this together with the library. And uh, could you just get one last uh, round of applause for this panel of great people who's come up here and inspired me. Oh, thank you.